Number nine. Number nine. Does anybody know that reference? It's the Beatles, right? Fewer and fewer people every every semester. Okay, so slideshow. Urinary system. Tinkle time. So here are all the functions. We think about the kidneys for urination, but it does so much more. It's actually a huge, importantly center, important center for homeostasis. The, the true center of homeostasis is actually what H word in the brain? Hypothalamus. But the kidneys do a lot of homeostatic functions that revolve around the blood. So here they maintain water balance. If you have too much water, they help get rid of it. If you have too little, they help you retain it. They regulate um, electrolytes and, and extracellular fluid ions. So sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium. If you have too much of these things, it helps excrete them. If you have too little, it helps absorb them, keep them into your body. Number three, maintain proper plasma volume. So it's not just water balance, like osmotic balance, but the actual amount of water that's in there too. So if you're bleeding, if you're bleeding severely, what's going to happen to your urine output? It should drop. Why would it drop? Why would your urine output drop if you're bleeding really bad? Because you're trying to retain that water to bring your blood volume back up. Maintain osmolarity. I kind of already talked about that with water balance. But osmolarity is not just water concentration. It's, it's the concentration of water to what? Solutes. So proteins, amino acids, sugars, anything to solute. So it helps maintain those things too. Number six, eliminate waste products of bodily metabolism, like acids, for instance. When you metabolize proteins, you produce a lot of acids. Your kidneys help get rid of those acids so you don't become too acidic. It's like when people go on the um, Atkins diet, they're taking lots of proteins, so guess what happens to their blood? It becomes very acidic. If you test their urine compared to the average person, their urine is extremely acidic because their kidneys are doing what? Trying to get rid of all that acid that's building up in the blood. It's the same thing if you if you take in too many bases and your blood becomes too basic, the kidneys will try and regulate that. So body of lean metabolism. Uh, number seven, excrete many foreign compounds like penicillin, like uh, any medications that you take. The liver will break some of the components down. The liver will, or the kidney will urinate the rest out. Penicillin's always an interesting one. Um, penicillin, back when they first started developing it, what they found is that your body hates penicillin so much. Penicillin's not really bad for you. It doesn't affect your cells very much. It affects what that gets into you. Bacteria. It prevents bacteria from building their cell wall and replicating. So it kills off the bacteria, which penicillin is good for you, but your body detects it as foreign, so it says, get, the, get this stuff out. So as soon as you take penicillin in, usually within a half hour to an hour, you've urinated most of it out. That's old penicillin. The penicillin you take today has been modified so you can't. But back in the day, we were kept running out of penicillin storage because people would urinate it out faster than get rid of the bacteria. So what do they have to do to get it back in them? They would actually drink their own urine to get the penicillin back in. So when you, when you were in a hospital, right when penicillin was first developed, as you were taking this penicillin, you have to drink your urine to keep it in your system. Mm -mm. Number eight, secrete erythropoietin. What is that? It's a hormone, which this is, I know is at least the second, probably the third time you've heard about it, that helps you do what? Make red blood cells. Yep, it regulates the production of red blood cells. That's made in the kidney. Number nine, secrete renin. Another hormone we haven't talked about yet, but it's a huge important hormone for regulating blood pressure. So it secretes a chemical called renin. It's a hormone that helps regulate blood pressure. And then number 10, it converts vitamin D into its final active form. So vitamin D was made in the skin. It was activated where first? The liver's first activation, but it wasn't complete, and then it goes to the kidney to get the final activation. So the kidney does a lot more than just make tinkle. The anatomy of the kidney, the renal artery, the renal vein, I'm not going to go into super detail, but you know the renal artery carries blood in, the renal vein carries blood out. Just kind of refresh yourself with the passageway. So here you have the aorta, the descending aorta, pushing blood into the renal artery that goes into the kidney. When you look inside the kidney, it goes all the way up here into the capillary beds of the kidney. The capillary beds of the kidney actually have special names. They're called glomeruli. We'll talk about that in better detail. But the capillary beds allow diffusion or exchange back and forth, but they also give you a chance to filter the blood and get rid of toxins. 
So we'll talk about this in a lot of detail. Once that blood's filtered, then it starts coming out to venules, back into veins, and it's carried off to the rest of the system. That product that's made, whoops, sorry, the bad product, the filtrate's what we're going to call it, because it isn't actually urine yet. It's a filtrate. It's filtered blood. That drips down in here to the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis drips it into the ureters. The ureters drop it down into the bladder. The bladder stores it down here. The bladder stores it, and when the bladder distends enough, then it triggers this micturition response, which is tinkling, and then it allows the passage through the urethra. The micturition response is just like the defecation reflex, which we'll talk about again. So there are the structures. That's the anatomy. When you look at the pathway of the urethra, this actually says a lot. Why is it women usually will tinkle themselves a little bit if they laugh too hard compared to men? I don't believe I've ever laughed so hard I've peed myself. That's, that'd be a really good laugh, though. That'd be a laugh on top of a laugh, actually, if I laughed so hard I peed myself. But look at the, the length of the urethra. It's not very far from the bladder in women, so if you laugh and you compress abdominal muscles when you laugh, there's always that chance you could squeeze a little bit of it out. With men, it's a lot longer passageway. All right. This is definitely worth a couple stars, or a big box around it, or arrows saying, I got to know this. You have to know these. There are two vascular systems. Actually, I shouldn't say vascular. There are two tube-like systems. One's vasculature, which are blood vessels. The other one's actually called the tubular component of the kidneys. This down here carries filtrate. This carries what? What's the vascular part carry? Blood. The vascular component carries blood. The tubular component carries something called filtrate, which is pre-urine. I don't care which one you call it. Filtrate and pre-urine are the same thing. They're just not urine yet. They're being filtered and cleaned and processed. But the vascular component, you should be able to list all the way through. So if I'm looking, out here I have my main artery carrying blood in. As it gets all the way broken down into that little glomerular area that I was talking about, as it's carrying blood into the glomerulus, it's actually carrying through something called an afferent arteriole. So the afferent arteriole is carrying into the glomerulus, which is a group of what? What's an arteriole always carry blood into? A capillary. It's a specialized capillary bed. So the glomerulus is a specialized capillary bed. It's full of blood. It's very porous. It's there like a spaghetti strainer to filter the blood. Right? So the blood flows through the glomerulus, and about 20% of it, 20% of the fluid is actually dripped out into these tubule components. The rest of it, the other 80%, is carried off into the efferent arterial. The efferent arterial becomes all of these little capillaries that surround the tubules, and they're called the peritubular capillaries, hence the name surrounding, or peritubular, the tubules. They surround or wrap around the, the tubules. So again, afferent arterial carries the blood into the glomerulus. The glomerulus is like a filter. The remaining 80% of the blood that leaves the glomerulus goes into the efferent arterial, which becomes the peritubular capillaries. And then the peritubular capillaries will all merge back together into a venule which dumps into the renal vein and carries the blood away. Those are all the blood components. Next, the tubular components. And the tubular components start right here surrounding the glomerulus. Even though it looks like a C-shaped structure, it's actually a ball. It's a capsule. Here you have the glomerulus, which looks, always reminds me of a ball of yarn. And then all you've done is you put a protective covering all the way in three dimensions around the glomerulus so that anything that leaks out of the glomerulus is caught by this capsule. And that capsule is called the Bowman's capsule. That's the very beginning of the tubules. That's always the very beginning of the tubules. So you can follow this passageway. You start at the Bowman's capsule, which catches any of the leaked filtrate. The filtrate moves into the proximal tubules because they're closest to the beginning. The proximal tubules are important because the proximal tubules are like a recycling bin. They watch this filtrate drip through and they're going to recycle important things like they'll pull sugar back into the blood, they'll pull sodium back into the blood, they'll pull calcium back into the blood, any amino acids. And I'll go into that in way better detail, but that's the proximal tubule, they're like a recycling center. And then as that starts dripping down further, would that be an ascending or a descending pathway when it's dripping down? As it drips down, it's actually called the descending part or descending segment of the loop of Henle. Because look at this long thing. It drips way down. It loops back up. What would the up part be? 
the ascending limb or the ascending segment of the loop of Henle. And then it comes all the way back and crosses over at the beginning. Here's where we started at the glomerulus and look at this thing. The ascending section goes right up to the glomerulus and then it changes names. Now we call it the distal tubule. But it crosses right over at the beginning. In fact, it crosses right between those two blood vessels. This is super significant. A lot of times, and this, you won't see this slide over and over a lot, but when you look at a real nephron, which is the structure we're looking at, this part of the distal tubule crosses over at the beginning. A lot of times you'll actually see it drawn like, uh, that's still not a really good example. Still not a good example. I guess you will see that a couple times. You, a lot of times you'll see it where they, they separate it and they draw the distal tubule way over here, but it's not realistic. What they've done is they've taken a three-dimensional structure and they've kind of just flattened it out for you. But the significance here is the distal tubule comes right back to where everything started. Because this is where you're monitoring how well did you concentrate your urine. Did you take everything you need out? It'll compare it to the original blood and say, whoa, this concentrate's wrong. And then it'll adjust how fast you're concentrating, how fast you're recycling. So the distal tubule is that last segment where you're actually consciously monitoring the, the filtrate. Or your kidney's consciously monitoring it. And then finally, after it's been completely cleaned and, and cleared of everything you don't want, you dump it into this collecting tubule. And the collecting tubule is the distal tubule of lots of nephrons. They're all collecting together. It's almost like a bunch of streams that come into a big river. So now you have this big river that's flowing this basically urine now. The urine's going to flow down to the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis is going to dump into the ureter. And the ureter dumps into the bladder until you eventually relieve yourself and it goes out the ureter, or sorry, urethra. Right? This is one nephron. Those are all the components of the nephron you have to, you have to memorize. If you didn't memorize them in anatomy, you're, you're going to have to memorize them now. It's physiology. It's a step-by-step -step process. And if you know each of these components, it'll be a little bit easier to memorize the steps. All right, so the nephron is the functional unit, and that's where the filtration happens. You have about one million nephrons per kidney, about one million nephrons per kidney. If you destroy a nephron, if you break a nephron, it never grows back. So as you age, you slowly start killing one nephron at a time off. What's that tell you about aging? What happens to the efficiency of your kidneys as you age? They get less and less efficient. And if the kidneys are good for um, regulating water volume, then it's going to tell you older people have a, have a little bit more difficult time regulating water volume. If the kidneys are there for getting rid of things like, like drugs or toxins or things that shouldn't be in your body, what's it tell you about older people? They can't clear it so much. Think about drugs. When you're prescribing drugs, if you haven't taken pharmacology, what do you know about older people? You have to be more careful because they're more susceptible to what? Overdose. They don't clear drugs the way that a younger person does. So if you give them the same dose at the same regular in intervals as a younger person, you have a higher risk of them overdosing on the drugs. And it's because their their kidneys, their nephrons, these things don't work like they used to. Okay, so here you can see different nephrons. There are different types of nephrons. We're going to talk about two types. You can see one's longer than the other. This shadow in the background is a kidney turned on its side, if you didn't notice. So as the blood's getting cleaned and filtered, that filtrate moves along to the, what's the first segment called? That cup. Bowman's capsule into the what? proximal tubule, this is the recycling bin, and then down the descending loop, and it's going to get concentrated more. We're pulling lots and lots of water out. Over here, we're going to start recycling some of the salts until it gets into this segment over here, which is what? The distal tubule, where your kidney has a chance to say, did we process that well enough? Do we concentrate the urine enough? Is it too dilute? Is it too thick? What are we doing here? And then finally, it pushes it into the what? The collecting duct, where it's lots of nephrons dumping into the same collecting duct. And that's where the urine's formed. And then it goes to the renal pelvis, to the ureters, to the bladder, and then out through the urethra. Right. So what do you know so far? Which is true about the vascular component? When you see vascular, you should think what? Filtrate or blood? You should be thinking blood.
Puppet number one, true or false? The efferent arterial brings blood into the glomerulus, or to the glomerulus. False. What do you know about efferent? Every time you've seen it, it means it's taking stuff away. It's exiting something, right? So efferent takes away, not into. Number one's wrong. How about number two? The afferent arterial is wider than efferent. Uh-oh, I may have forgot to mention something. Let's figure this out real quick. If you have 100% blood flowing into the glomerulus, but you only have 80% going out, what's that tell you about the efferent going out? It's smaller. Yeah, I forgot to point that out. Damn, I hate it when I do that. I should put that in the slide so I just remember it. So which one's going to be bigger, the afferent or the efferent? The afferent. It's almost like if you have a series of sprinklers and you have a garden hose going into the first sprinkler, the one going out of that first sprinkler is smaller. You go to the second one, the one going out of that second one is smaller. Because you're carrying less and less water, because you've lost more and more each step. So the efferent is actually smaller than the afferent. And I'll, I have a whole slide that talks about details of that later. I just forgot that it wasn't mentioned yet. So, damn, I just gave that one away. Number two is definitely true, afferent arterial. How about number three? The glomerulus is found in the U-shaped portion of the loop of Henle. Where's the glomerulus found? Inside of the Bowman's capsule, yeah. Number three is wrong. How about number four? The afferent arterial drains its blood into the pericubular capillaries. Does the efferent arterial drain into the peritubular capillaries? So remember, here's the afferent going into the glomerulus. The efferent goes into the peritubular capillaries. It turns into the peritubular capillaries. They all gather at the venule and then go back into the renal vein. So number four is wrong. Number two is the only right answer. All right, further drainage, we're not going to go into super detail. This is just fine-tuning the drainage. Once you get out of the nephron, then it goes to the papillary ducts, to the minor callus, to the major callus, to the renal pelvis, ureter, bladder, urethra. It's anatomy. Okay, first special structure in the nephron is called the juxta glomerular apparatus. I always remember this thing is juxta next to the glomerulus. Where is it? Just next to the glomerulus. So it's the combined tubular component. When you look, if you drew a little like circle, a little radius around the glomerulus or right here, it's all this stuff in this area. This is a special area because this is where blood's draining in to become filtered, and it's also where the distal tubule is being regulated by concentration. This is almost the quality control centers, if you had to give it a nickname. It's the quality control center of your urine. It's making sure the urine's just right concentration, not too concentrated, not too dilute. Right, so it's where the vascular component and the tubular components overlap. And we're going to talk about some special areas. You have an, a special area in the distal tubule that are called the macula densa cells. It's just a group of cells that are called the macula densa cells. They're measuring concentration of urine. The granular cells are in the blood vessels, and they're measuring the con or concentration, the pressure of the blood. They can regulate how much blood flows into that glomerulus. So if your urine is too concentrated, they'll open up to push more water in. If your urine's too dilute, what do you think they do? They constrict down to put less water in. And we'll go over that in better detail again. But the just glomerular apparatus is the quality control center that's located around the glomerulus, juxta next to the glomerulus. If you zoomed in on it and you sliced across that, so if we just took a slice and we cut through here and we looked at all of these blood vessel and, and uh, distal tubule, the distal tubule we're looking at is you're looking at the tube coming up. So you sliced across it and you're looking down into the tube from this perspective. Here you can see those macula densa cells that are measuring what? The concentration of the urine that's inside this distal tubule. Over here you have those granular cells that are measuring what? The blood pressure and they're also adjusting the blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is too high coming through here, they can squeeze down and slow down the blood pressure. If the blood pressure is not high enough, they can relax it. If the and like I said before, if the urine's too concentrated, they can open up and let more water flow through this so that you dilute your urine. And again, I'm going to spend basically a whole slide just talking about these cells later. Right. Next, the types of nephrons. I'm going to say neurons. 
So the type of nephrons, you have cortical nephrons and you have juxtamedullary nephrons. The cortical region is at what part? The deep center of the kidney or the surface of the kidney? Yep, just like in the brain when we said cortex, I said it meant bark of tree, which is on the surface. The cortical nephrons sit towards the surface. They're the more superficial ones. The juxtamedullary, the medulla means down deep into the center. These ones are long. They go way down deep into the center of the kidney. The significance of the two, the cortical nephrons, even though the bulk of the nephrons do very little concentrating of urine. The juxtamedullary do a lot of concentrating. The juxtamedullary nephrons concentrate, they extract or pull the water back into your body. If you were a desert animal, would you have more or less juxtamedullary nephrons? Think about it. If the juxtamedullary nephrons pull more water into your body, recycle more water, and you're a desert animal, would you have more or less juxtamedullary nephrons? You'd have more. I had a professor that, that uh, in grad school taught renal physiology, and he, in their lab they had a kangaroo rat, and he said you could always see, it just ran around, it wasn't in a cage, it just ran around the lab. And he said you could see exactly where it peed because it looked like a little tiny marble, a little yellow marble on the ground because its urine was so concentrated. It was a kangaroo rat that lived in the desert. Why would that be? Because genetically, its species had to pull a lot of water out of its urine. So whenever you saw this little drop of, it looked like syrup is what he said, it looked like a marble of syrup. And when you touched it with a paper towel, it was wet and it would soak into the paper towel. But it was so concentrated because they had so many more juxtamedullary nephrons that it could concentrate the urine way better than we can. There's one special blood vessel that's next to the juxtamedullary nephrons. It's called the vas erecta. It's a blood vessel. It's not a typical blood vessel. It's not the peritubular capillaries or an afferent arterial or an efferent arterial. It's one special blood vessel that runs along the ascending and descending loops of Henle only in the juxtamedullary nephrons. Only in the juxtamedullary nephrons. Okay, and you can see it, it runs right along. So goes here's your descending loop, goes all the way down and the ascending loop. All it's there for is to catch anything that slips out of this loop. So if you leak something out of the loop, it grabs a hold of it, pulls it back into the blood and shuttles it out of the kidney. Like water. When you're pulling all that water out, this vas erecta is collecting all the water and returning it back to the blood and, and shifting it out of the kidney really fast. Right. The cortical nephrons, you don't see that. So this is an example of a cortical nephron where most of it's up in the cortex. Barely any of it goes into the medulla. There's no vas erecta. It's just surrounded by peritubular capillaries. Put a star by this. Remember how I told you there were four steps of digestion? Motility, digestion, secretion, and absorption. Those four important things to look at when you look at the GI tract. There are three important things you're going to have to pay really close attention to in the renal system. The first function of the nephron is filtration. And it tells you where it's filtering. It's the glomerular filtration. When we learn about reabsorption and filtration forces, filtration always did what? Put things into the blood or took things out of the blood? Out. Filtration pulls things out of the blood. You're filtering these toxins out of the blood. You're filtering things out of the blood or taking it out of the blood. That's what the glomerulus does. It's basically a specialized spaghetti strainer. So as you push the fluid through, the small enough particles seep through. So where it says non-discriminant, it means that it lets anything that's small enough slide through. This is good and bad. It means it lets little tiny particles like acid, hydrogen ions, one little atom slide through. But unfortunately, anything that looks like a hydrogen can slide through too, like sodium, Na+, or acids, H+, sodium's Na+, they're about the same size. They're very similar in size. They seep through too. Do you want to lose all the salt that goes in your blood? No. So that's bad. They'll let things like... Um, well, calcium, phosphate, things that you do need seep out. They're actually going into that filtrate, that pre-urine. It's not selective. It's like when you put salt in the water for spaghetti and you dump it in the strainer. Do you keep the salt in the spaghetti? Nope. You keep some of it in the spaghetti, but you're dumping a lot of it down the drain. So you accidentally lose it with the water. It's the same idea. Sugar can slide through here. Do you want to lose the sugar into your urine? Nope, sugar slides right through and into the pre-urine, the filtrate, but you don't lose it into your urine, so what must happen to that sugar? It gets 
reabsorbed, which are the next steps. So once you've filtered things into that filtrate, now you need to reabsorb the important things. And it's called tubular reabsorption because where is it being reabsorbed at? Reabsorbed at? The tubules. All those tubule structures that we were talking about, like the proximal tubule, the ascending loop, the descending loop, the distal tubule, those things are all reabsorbing stuff into the blood. If filtration is pushing out of the blood, reabsorption is pulling it back into the blood. So what kind of things do you think you would reabsorb? I just gave you a hint at some of the things. Salt, sugar, yep, calcium, phosphates, all those things that you don't want to lose, you'll reabsorb. You pull them back in. Glomerular filtration, you might want to write this down here now, is a passive process. There's no energy put into it. It just dumps into the strainer and it leaks. That's it. When you're reabsorbing, it's an active process. That means your body has to put energy into it. If your body's wasting energy on something, is that important or is it not important? It's very important. If you're burning energy on anything, it's an important step. So anything that you're reabsorbing must be very important to your body. Sugar is important to your body, you reabsorb it. Sodium is really important to your body. Acid is dangerous to your body. Do you want to reabsorb it? No. You don't reabsorb the acid. And then the last step, secretion. Secretion means that it goes from the tubule and it pushes it. It's not filtered, it's actually pushed into the filtrate. It's an active process, it's actively secreting. If your body's putting energy into getting rid of something, what's that tell you about that something? It must be dangerous or bad for you. It's putting energy into it, right, you're, it's active, but it's telling you it's bad for you, like acid. Acid can be lethal to you, so you secrete acid. Some toxins are dangerous to you, so you secrete them. Penicillin is actually secreted because you're, it's not that dangerous to you, but it's foreign. It's made from mold. Your body's going to get rid of this stuff, so it's actually putting energy into secreting penicillin. All right, so those are the three major processes. Filtration is a passive process that filters the blood at the glomerulus. Tubular reabsorption is an active process that's reabsorbing important things like sodium, glucose, amino acids, I didn't mention that one. It brings amino acids back into your blood. And then tubular secretion is anything that didn't get filtered that should be filtered or getting, gotten rid of, gotten rid of? Seems weird. Should, you should get rid of is secreted. It's an active process to get rid of bad things. And then finally, after all three of these steps have happened, now you have real urine. That real urine goes into the renal pelvis, into the ureter, into the bladder, stored until you can finally urinate it through the urethra. And that's urinary excretion. Okay, so this is what the process looks like. Blood comes in through the bigger, wider afferent arterial, if I didn't mention that. And then it goes into the glomerulus, and it's what process is happening at the glomerulus? Filtration, yeah, about 20% of your plasma actually just leaks through here. Water, sugar, sodium, potassium, chloride, acids, it just leaks through like a spaghetti strainer. Once it's in here, now it's going to get recycled. The important things are recycled, just like a recycling bin, they go through and they pull out the important glass that can be reused, the important metals that can be reused, and they, they take the trash and just let it go on downstream. So the reabsorption is recycling it back to the blood, to the peritubular capillaries, if something in that 80% got by that shouldn't have gotten by. So remember, only 20% of the blood's filtered here. The other 80% goes by. And as it's leaking down with that toxin, like if it's full of acids, those acids can be actively pumped into the pre-urine and then excreted from the body. Those are the three processes you want to pay attention to over and over and over again. So much so that those are the next three main processes we'll talk about. Um, when we get back from break, we'll stop on this question. So. When liquid goes from the tubular lumen to the peritubular capillary, it's called what process? When a liquid goes from the tubular lumen to the peritubular capillary, what's it called? And I told you this, I actually secretly told you this before, when I said, everything that goes into the blood is called reabsorption. And there it is. It says it's going into the blood, right? It's going into the capillaries, so it has to be reabsorption. 
And that's it. Have a good spring break. By the way, if you're number 26 in lab, come find me. If your number is 26 in lab, I need you to come find me.